happy to welcome our guests in this stream. Um, this panel in particular is going to talk about um, how do we measure the success of DNI strategies. Um, we have a panelist joining us remotely, um, Eric Severson, who is the executive vice president. Vice President, the Chief People and Belonging Officer of Neiman Marcus Group. Hi, Eric. Just checking that you can hear us and we can see you. <laughs> oh, it's a little muffled, Monica, so I let the team know. It's a little hard to hear on your end. Okay. Can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you right now. Can you hear me better? A little better. There's a, it's a, maybe a resonance issue in the sound. Okay, I'll try to speak as clearly as possible. Um, and I'll just check in with the Ivy team and see if you can help us get a little bit better audio there. Um, I'll introduce the rest of the panelists for now. So next to me, I have Malaika Myers, uh, who's the Chief Human Resource Officer of Hyatt Hotels. Um, I have Tina Kao Milan, who's the Senior Vice President, Talent and Diversity at Schneider Electric, um, and Eric Severson, who is um, the executive, oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm Keith. <laughs> I'm Keith Sunderling, who's the commissioner of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, so thank you very much for all of you for joining us, and I'll let you sort of take on some of the questions. So I think, um, first of all, we, I would just like to start talking about metrics, right, and data. Um, how do companies prioritize um, uh, this metrics to measure success. So how do your companies measure success? Um, and how have these metrics changed over time? You know, we know there has been increasing discussions about diversity and inclusion, you know, forefront of, of, of the general debate. So just curious to know how your organizations are, think, are thinking about diversity and inclusion, how are you measuring it? And what are your thoughts about how it has changed over time? Um, so I'll just open the floor to whoever wants to start with that loaded question. <laughs> well, when you put it that way, I'm not sure. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure I want to take it, but I'll, I'll take the first shot at it. I would say, um, you know, for me, when I think about the measurement over time, I think about how we even describe it, right? We talked about diversity for maybe, you know, two decades ago. And then we started saying, well, no, it's diversity and inclusion. And then we, then we said, well, is there also equity? So it's diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's also belonging now. So I think that actually tells a nice story about the journey of measurement, which maybe started with just counting people, right, and, and their ethnicity or their gender um, or their veteran status or other things that we could actually measure. And um, is now shifted into thinking about things like, well, OK, you might have people who who come from different backgrounds, but are you treating them equitably? And how can we look at that? How do you look at promotion rates or uh, retention rates or participation rates in programs in order to be able to understand whether there's true equity happening? Um, and then, uh, you know, inclusion is a place where I still think we have some work to do in terms of measurement because we, we typically look at things like um, how people respond to the various surveys that we send them, mm. colleagues respond to surveys to help us understand do they feel included? Are we, are we seeing different experiences for uh, one group of pe people versus another? And I think that's all helpful. I'm not sure there's like a silver bullet for inclusion. So if anybody has it or thinks they have it, I'd be interested to know what it is. Um, and then belong is a whole nother frontier. Um, I, I don't know yet how to measure belonging, um, mm -hmm. but I do think it's something we've got to get our, get our heads around. From a, from a higher perspective, um, we share our data, we've, we've published our data publicly so that um, people understand what it is we measure, we disaggregate um, our data as well so that we can look at each group and we don't get caught in a, you know, well, what's happening to diverse people, mm -hmm. um, but look at really what are the individual experiences of the groups that we, that we measure. Mm -hmm. Great. Maybe just to build on those comments, for us, uh, I think we all know that metrics matter and the specific metrics that you articulate and message to your employee workforce and to the market at large is super important, right? It, it, it really signals what's important to your organization. 
So I'd say at Schneider Electric, we have that whole range as well. So we, there's no doubt we have so-called fundamental representation metrics. Uh, one pragmatic case for us um, globally, we have a very specific metric on representation when it comes to gender. And gender certainly is not the only diversity that companies need to think about, but it's definitely one of our core. So we have put out there for a five-year sprint until 2025, so the clock is ticking, and we have a lot of work to do around 50, 40, 30. And what that means is globally, this is not just a regional effort, but globally, we aspire to hiring 50% women, 40% women in frontline management, and 30% women in kind of top management. And I'd say for now, we've made pretty steady progress, but this last mile is getting tough. And I, I'm deviating from your question a little bit, Monica, but what I say is metrics matter a lot, but one has to be super careful about the metrics you articulate to the organization because in very transparent way, I, I would share, we are also in an interesting stage where being a technology engineering rooted company, people interpret metrics very literally. And this is when the power of metrics can be counterproductive to what you're trying to drive, right? If you're gonna drive DEI, we have to look at it holistically. We have to look, as you already pointed out, to belonging and culture and inclusion. And we have observed, again, quite transparently, where you hear stories on the ground in X country where, oh, we need to hire this person and it must be a woman. And that should not be the intention of those metrics, mm -hmm. right? And this is the healthy tension we've been having at Schneider more recently as we're super ambitious about some of these metrics, but also need to build a narrative and key principles around that is not the intention. It's not a pure quota system. It is about qualifications. It's about seeing the value of diversity in its all its beautiful breadth and making sure our decision makers, say a hiring manager on the ground, really thinks about those nuances mm -hmm. versus just being obsessed with a metric. Mm -hmm. Eric, can you hear us a little bit better? Um. Indeed, I think you might now we can hear, but I, we missed the question. Uh, yeah, no, no worries. Um, so the question, the initial question was basically around metrics, right? How, how are you guys thinking about diversity and inclusion? How are you using data? Um, or are you using data <laughs> to, to sort of reflect um, your thinking? And, and, you know, Tina just spoke a little bit about the, the opportunities, but also maybe, you know, how complex it can be to actually measure some of these things. So, so how are you navigating those discussions? Great, thank you for the question. I think my experience over the last 20 years or so, about 20 years ago, I was head of d &I for GAP and tried all the standard stuff and none of it worked. And one of the things that we learned there was if you want to make progress on anything in the business, including those that have a human dimension, you have to set hard targets and you have to measure a period of sort. That's how businesses run. So I've been experimenting that in the last couple of companies. What we did, you know, Marcus Group, is started in 2019 broader than DEI said, raise the same tools that we use with our consumers to evaluate what our associates value more or less. So we used a conjoint analysis to use marketing and they would call a voice of customer assessment where uh, your people tell you what is more or less important to them and how effectively are you delivering it. And what our people told us across the board, there was no statistically significant difference by race, gender, Etc. was their four things, total rewards, the pay and benefits, uh, flexibility, career advancement opportunity, and what we call belonging, or DEI and ESG. So we spent the last couple of years in investing in those things and measuring the outcomes. And what you see over that, the course of that period is, for example, our employee NTS, um, which likely to recommend, has gone up 34 points in that time. Our performance against specifically DEI on the 18 parts of the value proposition we tested. It was near the bottom in terms of effectiveness rating in 2019. When we last measured late 21, it was our number one most effective. 
And so I think at the end of this, how you do any business initiative is you find out what matters in the business, you track your performance, and you determine whether the actions you're taking, the investments and policies and programs are moving the needle. And I think DEI is no different. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Keith, do you have Yeah, and, and what? Testing? Yeah, I think, yeah. You have to pull, yeah. yeah. Okay, there we go. Well, from our perspective, you know, I have a unique perspective because from how the federal government looks at this, you know, at the EEOC, uh, our mission is to, let me fix this. How about now? There we go. It's to prevent, oh, now it's falling down. All right, I'll try my best. This is just weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Should have switched the one you got. I can hold the mic for you. Yeah. So our, our mission is to prevent and remedy employment discrimination. That's how most of you know the EEOC as a civil law enforcement agency with thousands of investigators, hundreds of lawyers who are bringing these federal actions if you violate anti-discrimination uh, law. But the second part of our mission is to advance equal opportunity for all in the workplace. And that's where we as the federal government fit into this equation. And a lot of people don't think of us uh, being a part of this, but we are. And I think it's very much on us to make sure that employers, like all of you, trying to create these programs have all the tools you need to be able to move forward and create diversity. And now it's not only diversity, equity, inclusion, but accessibility and all the other terms uh, for disabled workers. And not to get yourself in trouble, not to violate it, not like the example you said in another country, of course, where you know, we only want to hire women for this position because that's the same as saying, well, we only want to fire women for this position. So, you know, get that mentality out there. But from the data collection standpoint, you know, since 1966, the EEOC has collected EEO1 data, which you're all very familiar with, but that only tracks uh, sex, race, and ethnicity. Um, by generic industry codes. And, and the problem now um, for employers like you all who are trying to implement these programs, who are trying to get that more granular data to say, well, how, where are we really lacking in some new characteristics um, that are now more predominant in the workforce, um, such as disabled workers, LGBT workers, transgender workers, how do we get that data? Or even the religious workers and the affinity groups you wanna create. How do we get that data because the EEOC doesn't require that we collect it, but we want it. But at the same time, some employees will love to give you, you know, tell you what their religion is, um, tell you their sexual orientation. But what about those who do not want to tell you? And now also the EEOC and your lawyers are telling you, well, you can't know that information because the more information you know about their protected characteristics, such as their sexual orientation and religion, let's just use those two, that can then factor into the decision whether to hire them, whether, whether to promote them, which you can't do. So I really am very sympathetic with all of you who are trying to create these programs, but also have to deal with that sensitivity and the legality of making those decisions. And that's what I'm really um, trying to work on and why I'm uh, excited to be part of this panel, because there has to be a balance, um, because all of these programs, like I just started with, help employers um, with their diversity goals. It also helps the EEOC and the federal government advance equal opportunity. Uh, but at the same time, what is that balance of that data and how much can you know and how much do you want to know? Mm -hmm. I have a question because I think sometimes the easiest thing to measure is hiring, right? I think that's where a lot of um, some of this so, um, just thinking goes to, okay, what's the diversity of my workforce? Um, how are you guys thinking about, you know, well-being in the work or in the workplace, performance? Like, how do you incorporate these questions, not only about, you know, um, which employees are coming in and coming out, but how are they, you know, experiencing diversity in the workplace? Maybe I just comment, and it's a little bit responding to you, and also your comment, Keith. So I love the idea of, and it sounds very idealistic, but it, it kind of is a, a, a mantra that my team and I work on with the business of leveling the playing field, right? So it's understanding each of us. It could be a group. It could even be at individual level these days because the data allows you to really see it where we are at some kind of disadvantage um, in terms of access to opportunities at a company or a particular training program or whatnot. So what we try to do here with the data side is also make sure, um, have we 
looked under every single rock and really investigated how we see discrepancy or some kind of bias or some kind of differential experience for an employee, um, whether it be, again, hiring, promotion, training, et cetera. So I'm quite intrigued and I love the idea of applying the data in very programmatic, very much creating um, programs and employee experiences that create a forcing mechanism where there's more transparency, for example, there's more employee empowerment in what you do. And I just leave with one pragmatic example, and it's a huge experiment for us at Schneider. And it's not perfect, but it's something where data and the spirit of everyone deserves a right to find an opportunity within the company in a transparent way. It shouldn't be and it still exists where it's just in a room full of smoke and a hiring manager taps you on the shoulder and says, Tina, you're ready for your next move. And you have no idea where the circumstance or the context. So in the midst of COVID, and it's a couple of years now, but the summer of 2020, we launched globally what we call our open talent market. So this is something that is internally focused, very AI and data driven. And the AI also has to be non-biased and, and whatnot. So that's another topic altogether where employees use data and machine learning and AI driving the, the experience to find their next opportunity within the company. And it's global. And we have around 80,000 employees now on the platform. And they look for internal projects, so-called internal gigs. They find mentors. They look at career paths. Now, my point here is it's very data-driven and very outcome-driven, and we gauge the success of that by our people using the platform, our people finding opportunities, so concrete outcomes that enhance the employee engagement there. And what I also love about it, we don't codify people by um, race, ethnicity, age, demographics. It's really meant to be based on your skills, your interest, um, and some AI matching. Here, Tina, here are three recommendations of things you might pursue in terms of a mentor or project. It's hugely disruptive. We face challenges all the time. Um, again, certain unintended effects. Uh, managers don't want people living in an open talent market. They want to hold on to their talent. All the classic things I'm sure my panel is super familiar with. But I believe certain programs or platforms can be an accelerator to equalize the playing field and then also accelerated by some data and metrics. So that's one of the big global experiments we've been doing the last two years. Yeah, maybe I'll build on that because um, I, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, um, I think for us data has helped us to understand where we, where we have roadblocks for mm -hmm. people across the organization. So um, general man, I work for a hotel company, General manager of a hotel is a big job. It's, I often describe it as the most important job we have across the whole company. Um, and it's traditionally been a job that's filled by men. Mostly white males have, have filled those jobs, like historically. Um, and so one of the things, and, and we had a, a real history um, of shoulder tapping. Of, of people, of it, you know, being based on relationships and who you worked with in the past, and not to say that they weren't skilled, but that was sort of how, if you go back 30 years, that's how people moved around the organization. Um, and so we look at the data and we say, we have a, a general management development program. We don't have enough women and people of color coming through that program, right? So that, there's the insight. Like, you're not going to get that outcome of more diversity in that role if you don't have enough people who are actually in the development program. And so then we peel back that layer and say, well, okay, well, how come we don't have more people in the development program? And so one of the things we're experimenting with, which is similar to what you, what you just described, is we actually said to the whole, we did this in the US, uh, we said to everyone in the US who works in a property, do you want to be a GM? Mm -hmm. We'd never actually gone out and just done an open casting call. Right. Mm -hmm. Who wants to be a GM? <laughs> um, and um, so that, First of all, that gave us access to a whole cadre of people who, you know, we didn't know what they wanted to do and we didn't have them on our list. Um, but when offered the opportunity, they, they raised their hands and said, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. And now we're taking each one of those folks through an assessment that helps them understand, here's how you assess against the profile for what we look for. Let's now put a plan in place to help you to, um, 
to, you know, to hopefully achieve that outcome. But I think the data is the place we started, which was to say, well, we know what the results are. They're not what we want them to be. Let's look, let's go back one step and say, how do they even get to be a GM? Well, they usually come through this program. Okay, well, there's not enough people, diversity in that program. How do people get in the program? Well, that, you know, sometimes they're asked or they know. It's like, okay, let's open that up. So I, I think data can help you if you use it to, to peel back, to figure mm -hmm. out what, what's the underlying thing you're trying to solve for. You, get, you need to go back, I'd say, as far as you can in your processes to, you know, where people initially start to formulate what they want to do. And maybe AI is an interesting way to help them to do that. Yeah. Um, but you have to have, find a way to help people formulate ambitions and then make it really transparent to the organization what those ambitions are. Mm -hmm. And if I could just mini add, sorry, because mm -hmm. I love your point because um, it's also a cultural shift, right? You and I work for big companies, so um, sometimes that willingness to also accept transparency and very employee-driven right. ways. And frankly, we know that, right? Employees, they don't live in a bubble. There's so much data out there within your company or outside. So to stay ahead of that curve and also be bold and a little vulnerable as a company to have that data um, animate trends yep. or insights that management usually wants to influence or have a scorecard. That is an exciting and sometimes scary space to be in, right? So I, mm -hmm. I, totally, I totally echo your, your comment and what you guys have done there. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll, I'll pass it on quickly to Eric, but just to pick up a little bit of what both of you said, um, Malik, you said, you know, data is a conversation starter. It sort of tells you what are the things that you have to work towards, and then, you know, it's, it's, it gives you an idea. Um, Tina, you mentioned AI and bias, and I think you know that's not only a technology problem, but it's how to use data. What is the data telling you? But also, what it is, what is it not telling you, or maybe where, why is it leading to the wrong diagnostic? Right. So I think that that's a question for everyone <laughs> who uses data. Um, and Eric, Keith, sort of curious to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, so from my perspective, I've really been looking into the use of artificial intelligence in the workplace, specifically related to HR. You know, when you start talking about AI in the workplace, a lot of conversation drifts from the actual uses we're talking about to automating everything. It, but it's not about that. Uh, HR departments today are being sold HR technologies for every aspect of the employment life cycle. And, you know, it can really help eliminate one of the biggest problems uh, in my world, which is human bias. Right, by taking out the human from the HR, which also has problems yeah. <laughs> because you still need <laughs> HR departments and you still need um, a human to have that oversight. So what I've been really talking about is the, the results of uh, these automated systems, the results of what we're going to. And whether it's based upon the data set or whether it's based upon the algorithm and the user, we really need to see what the results are because from our perspective, if these AI systems are discriminating and a lot of that more is on the hiring side, on the front end side, you know, we're gonna see that you know, a class of individuals, let's just say women, were not selected and why did that happen? Was it the data set because women weren't re represented properly in that data set in the applicant pool? And we'll use that general manager uh, instance for example because historically women don't apply to be general managers. Or did we have a wonderful data set and we did what you said and we went to uh, women's colleges and we tried to diversify that data set and have more women apply to this general manager position but still suddenly for some reason it was just white men being picked by the computer. Was it then the algorithm itself? Was somebody actually in there just sifting it through it? So you have to look at, at both ways. But it can really help um, on the front end with those data sets in increasing diversity using the data points through artificial intelligence. Because, you know, and I know the classic example here in Silicon Valley uh, where we are is um, job descriptions for engineers. They normally said, oh, I'm looking for a ninja coder or I'm looking for a rock star. I mean, that's just, you know, the, the normal lingo um, out here of who that is. And when you think of a ninja, you think of a male. But you, using artificial intelligence now, there's now programs that go through your job descriptions. We all know the historical issues uh, with job descriptions. A lot of them are just copied and pasted from the internet. Not that anyone in this room would do something like that. But you, know, you don't know what you're building in there. You don't know what historical biases you're putting into that job description that may have nothing to do with the position 
you're looking for. So there's now AI that goes out there and looks for the words that are used in job descriptions and tries to gender neutralize them by scanning hundreds of thousands of job descriptions by actually looking for inclusivity. Also, on, on the skilling perspective of, you know, I'll continue to use the general manager uh, position, <coughs> of going through and just eliminating characteristics related to uh, historical barriers to enter into those positions. So, you know, the classic example I like to use is, you know, for all hiring is a name. You know, what does a name of a person, of an applicant, tell you about their ability to perform the job? Absolutely nothing. What it does is tell you characteristics that the EEOC has said you're not allowed to look on, such as their gender, their race, their religion, who knows what you can get from a name. So using AI in these data parts to completely mask any characteristics associated with those historical um, characteristics that have prevented those people from wanting to apply or being in the workforce and going to the skills-based approach you said um, is really helping diversify and getting to a lot of this. So there's a lot of really good uses of AI uh, in the workplace to remove the bias. But again, if the human is not in the loop where I started, you know, it could potentially um, really scale discrimination if we're not checking who's in those data sets, if we're not checking where we're getting all the um, applicants for, because if we're just going to the same pools, What's going to happen? You're still going to get, in your example, the white men only applying for general managers because that's all the computers ever saw who's applied for that position. Mm. Eric, any thoughts for you? Yeah, thanks, Mike. And reflecting on what Malika Keith and, and Tina said, I noted that nobody mentioned training, and I actually think that demonstrates progress because for a couple of decades, the First thing that most employers would go to if they want to make progress on DEI is to train people. And I'm not saying that training doesn't have a place, but my own experience has been if you want to make progress measurably at DEI, uh, if you're not going to get it, then training alone has to be achieved through operations. And they describe operational shifts, whether it's casting the net wider on where you look through your GMs or having an open marketplace. That's what we found. So it, I think. Leveraging what we call the bias interrupters and inserting those throughout all of your talent processes is the way that you can have confidence to set hard targets, for example, on representation. A lot of companies are afraid to set representation targets because they're afraid they're going to be confused with quotas or people who use race, gender, or other prohibited characteristics to make employment decisions. And what we did is we set targets and then we said, we're going to deploy a series of bias interrupters that are evidence-based that do not take race, gender, or any other prohibited characteristic into account. And then we're going to track our progress. So for example, on hiring, we've implemented diverse slate requirements. That's the first state of Canada requirements for recruiters. Diverse hiring panels, we require that there be leaders of color or women in the hiring panel and diverse sourcing requirements. And we did that at Davida. We saw the movement just in one year of doing that with fidelity of our vice presidents of, of color um, from 3.5% up to 12% in one year without ever one time in any hiring decision using race or ethnicity as a criteria in hiring. And I think that's really part of the key is you treat this subject like any other business initiative. You can have bias interrupters in any part of your business when we implemented we call it energy wave or Energy Wow, which is our mm -hmm. radical hybrid approach where people can work wherever they want, whenever they want, as long as they get the work done. That, for us, is a bias interrupter because every study out there will, yeah, on the subject will demonstrate that women still bear the majority of the child care, elder care, and home care responsibilities in the United States. For example, two-thirds of our population is probably the world all the way to the entry level are women. So we, we wanted a policy that was going to create a level playing field for mm. women to continue to advance in our company in a way that's equal to men. Both men and women are uh, eligible for the benefit, but it's, it's an example of a bias interrupter that doesn't privilege anyone, but it, it creates a level playing field. Mm. And I, for anyone who's interested, I would refer you to biasinterrupters.org. It's the website of the Center for Work-Life Law at the University of California East Things. Joan C. Williams is the, the founder. She runs the center. And she also the book, a similar name, Bias Interrupted. It goes through talent management practices, one by one. Recording in progress. <laughs> talent from talent review, succession management, hiring, and gives you proven evidence-based <clears throat> ways that 
are lawful and for which you will um, likely not get an EOC charge. It's a good thing. And I think that's very interesting, right, is this idea of neutrality, right, and gender neutrality, race neutrality, but also the fact that there are things that you can't be neutral about, right? You have to have kind of a, an understanding of the different paths that people are taking. Right. So we're about to have to wrap on this panel, which has been incredibly interesting, but I want to give you guys a couple of minutes just to close down on, on the discussion. I'm glad Keith said that HR still matters, by the way. It, it does. <laughs> and, and, you know, humans, as I'm in Silicon right? yeah, Valley, where all this is being, resources. you know, you can't, in all seriousness, when it comes to AI, a lot of it being sold in the other aspects of your business, um, to, it makes deliveries faster, it makes, you know, your company more money. But in HR, you know, you're now dealing with some of the most fundamental civil rights in America, which is the ability to enter and thrive in the workplace. So that cannot be automated, so HR will always have a job. But um, since I started <laughs> talking, I will, I will conclude in the sense where it's really, you know, from our perspective, everything we discussed about the equal opportunity. A lot of these programs are new, and there's a lot of general awareness of this. But from a legal perspective, and I hate to sound like a lawyer, but I am, <laughs> since the 1960s of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, everything we have been discussing has been required by federal law. And it's that equal opportunity uh, in, in the workplace. So you know, all these programs, whether it's technology or the just innovative thinking, um, from a law enforcement perspective is a really good thing because it, it is all meets our goal of you know, making sure that we do have diverse workforce, that everyone has an equal opportunity. And just how we get there is that continuing discussion. And also from our perspective, the fact that we didn't get a chance to talk about it um, for disabled workers um, with a lot with you know, the rise of uh, mental illness, um, the accessibility portion of it as well is really front and center. But again, if you look to the laws we enforce, all of this has been there the whole time, and I really am appreciative of all you being so innovative to, you know, to help us meet our mission from the federal government as well. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll build off Keith. Um, just uh, my final comment would be a way to think about the narrative is the rising tide lifts all boats, right? So we are trying to create equity of lots of things. And I think sometimes we forget the bigger picture that when you address issues of DEI or well-being or inclusion, you're actually helping everybody, not just one particular group. And I'll leave very quickly because we recently created an accessibility office in our company. And um, it's been fascinating, right? When you think about that curbside effect where you're building ramps for disabled people or differently able people, you help other people. You help people with canes. You help parents with strollers of young children. And that rising tide is something we forget. Like sometimes DEI can get so emotional and politicized. Mm -hmm. And actually the net effect for a company, employees, and the business can be overall super beneficial. Yep, um, great points. I think I, I'd leave you with this, because we've talked a lot about data and programs, and those are all incredibly important to forward progress. But I think one of the things that um, has really been crystallized to me over the last few years is the importance of really engaging your workforce. Like, right. not just top down, but bottom up, yep. right? And help, and giving everyone a part in creating this equitable, inclusive environment where, where we can all feel like we belong. And we've done a lot of work with, with trying to help our colleagues feel like ever, all 150,000 of them all have a place and a role in making sure that we have an inclusive environment. Our, our purpose is to care for people so they can be their best. Right. And we say like that's everybody. We care for everyone. So that's the other bit I would encourage you to think about is just how are you really engaging not just your hiring managers and your leaders, but the front line, the, you know, the, the employees who are out there um, just doing their job and helping them to understand how they can help create the kind of environment that we all want to work in. Eric, any, any final words? Yeah, I was just done with what Tina said about the rising tide of salt boats. So years ago when I was at Gap Inc., we had a hashtag called Women and Opportunity. And the, the tagline was, what's good for women is good for everyone. And it's based on a major research study that showed 
that when employers put in place bias interrupters and core talent processes intended to, uh, to interrupt bias against women, it actually improved the upper mobility of people of color and others in the company, including white associates. So I think the point is that when you interrupt natural bias in your systems inside your company, everyone benefits from that. And maybe the last thing I would say is uh, the Fugitive Pitch to Keith that we conducted a self-ID campaign this summer so we could attempt to quantify other attributes outside of the EO1, yep. like ability, uh, sexual orientation, religious orientation, et cetera. And it was, it's been really useful as we get the data. And what I would say is we had, despite a big push, about 25% participation. <coughs> and what I would say is anything that the EEOC requires is much easier to collect. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Because, it's the, because it's the law, right? right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I wish we could continue this chat all day because I know this is sort of really what's uh, so many of our thoughts, not just, you know, as people who specialize in this, but also as people who work in companies, right? Um, so I think this has been incredibly fruitful. I really appreciate your insights. And I hope that you stay around if the audience has any, any questions. Um, later on in the day. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, thank you all, Eric. Great.